तो तब ही देखिए तेरे दिल की दुविधा जा सब गए पलक में छो तो आया है सब जाएगा ने राजा रंग फकीर और कोई सिंहासन चढ़ चले न कोई बंधे जंजीर पर सब आया है कई घाट से न उतरा है कई बार या बीच में दुविधा पड़ गई तो हो गए बारा अलग अलग बाटों में विभाजित हो गए जाति में धर्म में मजहब में मत में पंथ में संप्रदाय में वी डिवाइड आर सेल्व अप इन सो मेनी वेज रिलीजन सेक्ट कास्ट क्लास होल लिस्ट जबकि एक ही घाट से आए हैं जबकि एक ही ऑल केम फ्रॉम वन घाट इट्स दैट प्लेस ऑन द रिवर वेर यू वेर द वाटर इज met by the person who goes down to the river aur wo ghat kabir ka ghat hai kabir's ghat he came from that ghat where it's all one kaha hai ye ji ghat hai pani sab bhare aur yo ghat bhare na ko और भरे सुनिर्मल उस घाट को जब भी हम परखेंगे जब सच्चे बनी बने अरे जो तू साचा बाणिया तो साची हाट लगा अरे अंदर झाड़ू दे के ये कचरा दे तू बहा शहर में आजा रे हंसा भाई त्रिगुण राजा के त्रिगुण से
Great master used to say, his teaching, his method, the path of the masters, Santmat, is meant for the brave, not for the weak. You have to be a warrior. He used to use the word, you have to be a warrior to be in this path. Why did he say that? What is the need to be brave and warrior in order to meditate and find yourself? He explained that many of us cannot cope up with the pralabd, the destiny we are born with. And we try to run away from it. We are cowards. If we cannot face what we designed as an experience of destiny, then that is not a spiritual path at all. That's escapism. The path of the Master says, you should be strong and be warriors and face your life where you have been placed in the middle. Cope up with all the ups and downs of destiny and then in the middle of it, escape and go back to your home from this network into which you have come. Great master used to say, his teaching, his method, the path of the masters, Santmat, is meant for the brave, 
not for the weak. You have to be a warrior. He used to use the word. You have to be a warrior to be in this path. Why did he say that? What is the need to be brave and warrior in order to meditate and find yourself? He explained that many of us cannot cope up with the pralabd, the destiny we are born with. And we try to run away from it. We are cowards. If we cannot face what we designed as an experience of destiny, then that is not a spiritual path at all. That's escapism. The path of the Master says, you should be strong and be warriors and face your life where you have been placed in the middle. Cope up with all the ups and downs of destiny. And then in the middle of it, escape and go back to your home from this network into which you have come. Hello everyone, can you hear my voice? Okay. Welcome everyone, welcome to today's satsang. Uh, so to, today's Shabad is by Pavanji, Soniyar Hamari Sajan, then introduction by Michael, then we have talk by Dr. Sand. Topic is how to balance worldly commitments and spiritual aims. Then we'll have short dance session of five minutes. And after that, we'll play a master's video and later we'll do group meditation with love and devotion. Thank you so much. Pavanji, I think you can start with the Shabbat now. सुन यार हमारे सजनाएक करूं बेनंतिया तिस मोहन लाल प्यारे तिस मोहन लाल प्यारे हाँ फिरों खोजन्तिया सुन यार हमारे सजन एक करो बेनंतिया तिस दास प्यारे सिर तरी उतारे एक पोरी दर्शन दीजे नैन हमारे प्रिय रंग रंगारे एक तिल भी ना तरी जे तिस मोहन लाल प्यारे तिस मोहन लाल प्यारे हों फिरों खोजन्तिया सुन यार हमारे ए सजन एक करूं बेनंतिया प्रभ सो मान लीना जो जाल मीना चात्रिक जिमे तिसंतिया जन नानक गुर पूरा पाया सगली तिखा बुझंतिया तिस मोह नलाल प्यारे तिस मोहन लाल प्यारे हों 
फिरों खोजंतिया सुन यार हमारे ए सजन एक करूं बेनंतिया एक करूं बेनंतिया My dear brothers and sisters, God morning. Welcome to Satsang. Welcome to the holy gathering of Ishwar Puri Ji, where we all gather here and bow our head to the feet of the perfect one and get his blessings, get his daily cup of nectar that Father God, Ishwar Puri Ji and Baba Sawan Singh, they serve us a cup of nectar, a cup of bliss, a cup of grace that is not served anywhere else. It's only, sir, it's only for the brave ones. It's only for the brave ones who want to cross the ocean of love and reach their true home. The, the brave ones, the, the true warriors, the true lovers of God who put their ego aside and know that we are all here the same, in the same boat, and all our heads are on the master's feet, and there is no him or her or she. It is only the presence. We only here sit in the presence of the perfect one. We invite the presence of the perfect one, and we eat and drink his nectar. As when, um, um, as when, the, as when the cup, as when uh, uh, Ishwarji pour the cup of nectar, and while you are pouring the cup of nectar, talk to us about it. Talk to us about the cup of nectar. And when the cup of nectar gets close to the lips, the ears, the ears get jealous, and they say, I want a taste. And then the mouth says, but you are not made for this. You are made to hear. You should be intoxicated by the by the nectar being, by the sound of nectar being poured into the glass. But the, and look at you, you are blushing and, and you, you are red. And then the ears say that, no, I want more. I, I want more than heat. I want to taste. <laughs> they want to taste the cup of nectar. Ear, so the cup of nectar is something that is so, 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 so graceful and so precious and so valuable that is being served to us every day. Every day, we go one step closer to God, one step closer to the kingdom of God. And there was this uh, saint, his name was Bustami, and he drank the cup of nectar from his master. And he was in ecstasy. And I was, as he was whirling in ecstasy around his students, he said, there, there is no God but me. I am God. And then when the, when the ecstasy passed away, and then his students confronted him, and said, you said that you are God. And he said, yes, I did. God is beyond the body. If I say that one more time, please kill me. Then the next night came and the master poured another cup of nectar. And Bustami drank from that nectar of his inner master. And then he went into ecstasy. His soul, the bird of his soul flew to unmeasurable heights. And he was drunk on God, drunk in the kingdom of God. And then when he was drunk on God and the kingdom of God, his reason, his reason, just like a, a minister in front of the king creeps to a corner, his reason creeps to a corner. And he said, there is nothing underneath this robe except God himself. <laughs> he was saying that because he was drunk in God. And then what happened when the creator of life enters the human body, the he and the she dissolves. <laughs> the he and the she dissolves. And somebody, an American who never spoke English, who never spoke Arabic, starts speaking in Arabic. <laughs> That's what happens when, when, the, when, the, when the creator of life enters the human body. And then all his students became angry that he said that, he is, that nothing underneath this robe 
uh, except God. And then the, the students drew their swords, drew, drew their swords and their knives, and they started stabbing. And what happened? Bustami was not there. And whoever aimed for the throat cut his own throat. And whoever aimed to pierce the, his chest pierced his own chest. <laughs> this is just a story, a story of, uh, of ecstasy, of, uh, of what happens, what happens when, uh, when uh, I guess when we reach totality and we start drinking that cup of nectar and we start to be intoxicated in God and in the kingdom of God that we forget who we are and then God is there and only God is there and then we reach a stage where we can say we are my father in the heavens are one. <laughs> As this world, there is two knowledges, two knowledges in this world that are being taught to us. One is from the animal soul and one is from the God soul, from the, higher, from the higher self. One comes from outside and one comes from inside. The one that comes from outside is very hard, is very torturous and is very... Uh, is, 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 and people rank you according to how much you can absorb this knowledge. If you absorb more of this knowledge and you can recite more of what you have, uh, what you have absorbed from this knowledge, people give you certificates and marks and then you are ranked higher than others. And this is the, the outside knowledge. The outside knowledge to me when I was young in the university, it was like, and in high school, it was so torturous. It was so torturous. And so I was always in agony. Every Friday when I was a teenager, I had to recite a, a, an Arabic poem. He gave, the, the Arabic teacher gave us a poem that we have to recite the whole poem. And I used to spend every Friday in torture, trying to put that poem in my brain so I would stand in front of the <laughs> students and recite that poem. And it was very, very, it was, I swear, I swear, I felt like I was in torture. I felt like it was like a torturous thing. And then, and then I went into high school and I was in the end of high school, like almost graduating and there was a government exam that was like so, 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 so hard physics and calculus and history and we had to sit in that exam in one week and if we don't pass it then no university will accept us because we are dumb we are fools and that nobody will accept us and i had to i had to go through that exam and i remember the day when my mom my mom i i, I like my my mind blocked up and i couldn't like comprehend i only studied 37 pages out of a 300 page book of physics and I had to still learn more and more about projectiles and Khrushchev and electricity and, and everything. And I, it wasn't entering my, my head. And I remember my mom putting my head in the shower and she's like praying to God to open my mind and, I, and keep me awake all night to just like put that rubbish, informa <laughs> rubbish information that is really not needed in my head so I can pass the exam. And she prayed so much that there was some divine intervention somebody stole the questions from the government and brought us the questions. And me and my friend, we tried to solve them at the last moment, but we were so tired and we didn't have the answers. He brought the questions, but not the answers. <laughs> so we still failed the test, even though we had the questions in front of us. This, <laughs> this was my condition in, the, in, the, in, in high school. And then in, uni in the university again, Again, more, more uh, classes like that, that I had to take. And guess what? There was more divine intervention. And somebody stole the questions from the, uh, the secretary, stole the questions, and he was selling them. And I was buying the questions. <laughs> that was a divine intervention. And somebody, and we were answering together, uh, answering them together, and then, uh, and then going to the test. <laughs> so this information of the world that is like so torturous. And so, so it is like uh, trying to know how many pebbles uh, are on the moon. This is like, what use is that knowledge? How, how many pebbles are on the moon for me, you know, as a human being with a human body? It is of no use. So like maybe God gave like some big brains to some, um, to, <laughs> to many people. But for me, it was all this information, this knowledge was torture. I always lived on God's grace. And, and, and from God's grace, I ate, from God's grace, I made a living. And that knowledge, that wisdom of the world, really, I went through college and I passed and I got a degree, but really, it, it did not really make sense to me. I, as I felt, it is so bored, bore, uh, boring, it's so boring, so untasty and so insipid. 
and uh, and then I in the, my masters I studied accounting and in the middle of it I was like oh my god I hate this this is like so 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 torture and it's just why would I like put in my head all these laws of taxes that have been changed and I have to uh, know them and then go into the CPA exam and, and write them down. It was another big torture. And, uh, you know, so this outside information, I'm just telling you that how I went through it in my life and it's torture. But then when Father God blessed me, when Santakar Singh appeared into my life, when he opened the door of wisdom, the door of knowledge that come from within, then that knowledge, that knowledge is the knowledge that quenches the, the soul. That knowledge is the knowledge that brings the wisdom. That knowledge is the knowledge that brings the peace. That knowledge is the knowledge that also brings, brings the God's blessing so he can give you, he can find something for you where you can make your own living, where you can, your bread of life, your water of life is given to you. Uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else shall be added unto you. That life will become easy. As this, all this animal soul, all this outer knowledge is just created from the inner knowledge. As the inner knowledge is the fountainhead, is the fountainhead of, of all knowledge. This is where we should drink. This is where we should eat from that fountain, from that fountain that is from within and not from without. As we try, if we try to drink from the outer knowledge, it will only burden us. It will only bring torture to us. It will only bring disharmony to us as it did, as it did to me. That's how I felt when I went through this life without a master and had to go through high school and had to go through college and through master's program. And I felt like this knowledge, I could, I was in, I was in college, but I could remember that nothing satisfied me, that I was not I didn't know what I want to study. I didn't know what I want to study. And I went through, uh, B, uh, through my BA and through my master's and through high school, not knowing what I want. Other than I knew one thing. I knew one thing that the human being is unlimited. I wanted to become unlimited. And I spent most of my time when I went to study in the library or in a bookstore, I spent most of the time reading Rumi, Hafiz, Shams, and spiritual books and trying to know the spirituality. I was seeking because I knew all this outer knowledge in, is insipid. That is why when, when Shams met Rumi, he told, and Rumi had all this knowledge and he was so learned with uh, the theology and the philosophy and he took all these books uh, and then uh, um, Shams took all these books and threw them in the pool. And Rumi was like, oh my God, oh my God, you did, why did you do such a, a horrible thing? And then, and then um, uh, Shams went and picked up those books from the pool and they were all dry because, you know, he was full of inner knowledge that can do anything, that the inner knowledge can open the outer knowledge can out, uh, and everything is born from the inner knowledge. This whole world is a reflection of the inner knowledge. So if we just go within, if we just become rich from within and just add the inner knowledge to us day by day, day by day, then we are true human beings. Then we are the true wise ones of the world. Why we are, are we the true wise ones and not that egoistic doctor, that egoistic engineer, that egoistic king? Is because they're all going to re be reshuffled in the cycle of reincarnation. The angel of death at the time of their death is going to yank them and they're going to show them their account and see, look how much you have earned. How much you have, uh, how much you have uh, collected of this worldly knowledge? It's taking you now to the gates of hell. Go there now. <laughs> this is what the outer knowledge does to us. But only the inner knowledge releases us from all this quagmire of mind and intellect and reasoning and all the tortures, and then brings the inner joy, the inner peace, and the inner ecstasy, and put put makes us the true wise ones full of God, full of the kingdom of God, and full of the true knowledge that brings happiness and peace. What are we all looking for? We are looking for pure joy, pure, pure ecstasy, pure happiness, and pure peace. And the people of the world try to find this ecstasy in the outer wine, in the outer drugs, in the alcohol, because, they, because their soul remembers something and remembers being drunk on something, but doesn't know what, because they're looking from the outside. And then and then it brings it brings them what it brings them 
suffering afterwards. After they drink this outer wine, this outer alcohol, and this outer drugs, you know what happens. Uh, you know what happens. Uh, you know there is always suffering after it. But when we come and sit at the feet of the perfect living master and we put our heads at his feet, bowing down his feet, then when our head is at the lowest, then the master pours and he pours the love, he pours the grace, he pours the the the, the cup of nectar and he quenches our 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 soul and then we are all happy we are all in peace and we are all in joy and our soul feels that this is the way this is the way and it clings to the hand of the master and when it clings to the hand of the master the true lovers never leave the hand of the master until they reach their destination even when they reach their destination in god and in the kingdom of god they will keep the hand of their master because he's the one who brought them there so this is my uh, my introduction for today. Thank you, Master. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, and uh, uh, may Master pour his cup of nectar on all of us. Um, now I welcome my very, very dear brother, Chan. And I love his mom's picture behind him. A true saint, <laughs> her, his mom, and I met her. Thank you, Medja. Michael, you have, uh, uh, as usual, you really motivate everyone to work on it. That's really wonderful. And uh, today's subject is balancing, you know, the, the worldly commitments and the spiritual aims. You know? That's how today's talk is based on that. Now, as uh, you have just heard, Ishwar Puriji talked that he says you got to be a warrior to do this balancing act, you know. Because on, on both the sides, you know, you got to do that balancing to go through this life. And uh, to understand the, uh, the nitty gritties of the whole thing is very, very important. Now to do the balancing, because once we know that here in this time-bound material creation, we need certain things for this body. And this body needs hunger, clothes, housing, vanities of the world, sex and sleep, etc. Now this is what is the requirement of this body. And to manage this requirement, how to really manage these areas, if we can understand the basic things here, that for the body there are certain things needed, but the mind, which deals with the information of the requirements of the body, and then it multiplies them, multifold them, makes many permutations and combinations. I remember that I talked about this earlier also, but now here, it is so, Im so important to understand that how to balance this particular area. Because without this body, we cannot, we cannot learn how to really take out the soul from the body and from the mind as well. From the body, it will naturally go once we die. But then the mind overpowers the soul and drags it as per karma theory because as I said in the earlier talk that how the a custodian of karma you know is managing us and that's how it is uh, dragging us down at the time of death into birth and death cycle again and again. Now the saints have given us this knowledge. Every time you listen to the satsang of Ishwar Puriji and Michael gives certain very good examples every time. So this is how we got to understand that this, he was talking about the cup of that nectar. So in Gurbani it is said, Nam Kumari Nan Ka Chadi Rahit Rat means that the intoxication of Nam 
keeps you intoxicated all your life. The other drinks you will drink and it will be off, you know, after a while. Next morning, you are again, you know, without that intoxication. Whereas the Nam keeps you intoxicated all the time. And how this Nam will really help you to work on it is an area. Now today our talk is that how to balance the spiritual area and this worldly area. For this, looking into the requirements of the body and the information which mind is providing to make permutations and combinations so huge, then you are engrossed here only day and night working for this body and its needs, you know. And the mind adds on the needs. Now here it is very important to understand that, uh, that these two don't have their own energy. They thrive on the energy of the soul only. Now how we will be balancing, and now the word is commitment also. Now commitment is with our family members, with the people around us, maybe uh, through the others, you know, the commitments are there. And including the tax commitments also. You got to pay your taxes to the government. So there are taxes. Because as we understand from the satsang, that it's a matter of give and take in the family. And we are here for that. Now happily, how to really manage these commitments that we are uh, in a family, we have got children, we have got spouse and all those relations. So all that we got to manage. And how we will manage them with an understanding and at the same time not to have that cribbing thing in us. We have not to do that cribbing that how we have to do for others. It is a slot which you have been given. And this slot is designed to manage your karma. As Ishwar Puriji also says, that if you get married, it is better it is you are, you are managing your karmas. And this marriage has happened because it helps you to disseminate your karmas there. Because there is a matter of give and take. But then for your family, you are doing all those works. But in all this, the most beautiful thing is to understand the kind of knowledge which will give you that balancing act. And that balancing act, you can know if you know a knowledge that after knowing, nothing remains to be known except living that knowledge and exploring it into your day-to-day -day life. This knowledge is that you are the divine, you have acquired the mind and created the body to have an experience here. So all that, whatever you have done, the karma you are facing, it is all your doing. Now, if I am doing to whom I should crib for, I have done it, but I have done it for an experience. So that's a, that is what should be at the back of your mind when you are passing through this life and trying to manage things. Now, this knowledge that you are defined, as Michael was giving that example, that whenever he is drunk, he says, I am God. <laughs> and that's how, if you, rather, if you act like that, don't behave, because people will not understand. The outside people will not understand. But within you, you know that divine is going to help you. It is, it is all knowing, all pervading. It knows. So it can give you that ability to steer through life. Now, how to steer through the, this life is that don't do that cribbing here while you are transacting with your family members. You are paying and sometimes you are receiving and sometimes somebody is cheating you. And many things are happening. So now Kabira talks on this. 
uh, he says that Kabira teri jhopdi gal katiyan ke paas. Hey Kabir, your house is near those slaughterhouses. Why you get sad? Because whatever they are doing, they will suffer for that. So just keep it there. Now you are taking out that particular cribbing part by understanding this part. Say within the family, if somebody is not agreeing with you or behaving differently, now you immediately think that every action has got an equal and opposite reaction. If they are doing something bad, they'll have to go through that. So now you have you are that soul which has got certain attributes in it. We explain those attributes like love, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, wisdom, humility, patience, state of art, planning ability, and its execution ability. Let us face as it comes, the soul has got that ability that it can pass through all the kinds of things because it has already gone through. 0.84 million species from a single cell it has gone through all that so it has already got that ability to face things as they come in life so this is this particular knowledge gives you that balancing act that you have got that ability to face things as they come in life and it is inherently with you you have to do nothing to achieve it, it is already there with you. Now, body and mind, is, this is how we have come here. It is our free will to have this experience. So happily, we got to go through this, through this particular area. Now, how to manage those commitments? Now, the, the best thing is to get connected to those intuitions. These intuitions will help you to go through all this and it is so easy that steering your vehicle this body through ups and downs of life bad roads or good roads because that ability gives you that state of art planning ability and its execution ability this is what your soul is because it is part of all knowing all pervading it knows how to steer through that and you know that you have got that ability. Let us face as it comes. You already have got that inherent ability to do this. So now looking into this, how to really balance this particular part where you have, you are like a, uh, let me say, that visitor, but this visitor is, is there. It is here as well as in the all the upper, areas like your astral body like your causal body like the universal body and you are connected there so as ishwar puriji one in his talk says that the saints at the same time they are everywhere in all these areas and since you are part of that you got to understand this part out of the satsang that you can remain calm because you are everywhere. Because if you know this, as I said, that after knowing, nothing remains to be known. And what you have known, that you are that divine. And you have crossed through this, through, through universal mind, causal mind, astral mind, the physical mind. That you are here in a physical body. You created that. Because you are you are a creator even you are energizing your mind which is Kal. you are energizing the material which is known as maya you have done it now understanding this part that you are at all the levels and you can manage this that should give you a satisfaction that you can manage it because through satsang we get this knowledge Without that, we would not have got this. The way Michael explains, all the saints, like Savan Singh Ji Maharaj, like, uh, you know, <clears throat> Swamiji Maharaj, 
in his Sarbachan, in all those books, they are explaining all this. And we are so lucky in this group that we listen all of them. What Kabir is saying, what Guru Nanak said, what Baba Jamal Singh Ji said, what Kripal Singh Ji said, and what all other masters have said. You are listening, all of them. Now you are enriched with all this. So this knowledge can help you balancing your spiritual life as well as this material life. Because then you can, you can deal with it. Because as I told you that there are local truths. So just ignore them. And you have to look. You've got to keep your target. Because that knowledge tells you the ultimate truth also. Then you can always know it is a local truth. Why bother about it? So now, keeping balance, something good has been told to us. What has been told? That we got to give 10% of our time for complete meditation. And 90% to manage these areas. And if we are with the absolute, if we are in that simmering, those intuitions will keep in real time and keep on helping you at various stages. And this is how you got to learn and start practicing this. Sometimes I say, allow the time to run ahead. Don't run after the time. And peacefully look at it. Maintain your calm. Because you are here. And once you know at the back of your mind, because mind needs all this information. Soul is already part of the absolute. It doesn't need any such sum. Because it is, it is the part. You are representing the absolute here. It is your mind only which will put hurdles. Now we are making that mind as a friend by informing him all this, what we learn in the satsang. So this is how we can do that balancing act here. We can manage with those 10% time to withdraw our attention when we are sitting in meditation. That gives us that opportunity to get connected. And through Simran, we always open the floodgate for the intuitions to come in. Because that Simran will not allow the mind to all the time poke its nose into all your affairs because it is dealing with past and future, past and future. And it is running with all that huge information and from the astral level and from the causal and universal. And as that custodian operates all that and he knows and he wants to poke you at different levels because the mind will keep on grabbing your attention to do its, you know, its part to make you suffer as per your karma theory. And, and how nicely you have been told that how to avoid those karmas because Sanchit has been taken over and the prarabhad is there, which becomes so simple. Then those commitments which you are, uh, you, are you are going through, the intuitions will guide you. And they'll guide you so nicely that you will have, you will receive those intuitions if you are in Simran. If you are busy with your mind to probe into those problems and give solutions which it does not have. The mind does not have solutions, my dear. It is very, very clear that mind is going to trap you into your karma theory because it is the custodian and it is, it is operating. It is putting you into that. Now, mind is always busy doing that. So, what happens? That to dealing from the mind, even for the prarabdha karma, to manage all this through intuitions, because it is guiding you, it is all the time with you. It gives you that, that particular, or those attributes which I explained. You know, love, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, humility, state of heart, planning, ability. Let us face as it comes. All those divine attributes, including patience, they are already there with you. 
Now, your attention carries all that. And it's like an omni scanner, and wherever the attention goes, the divine energy flows. So now, allow that attention to bring all that divine knowledge through those intuitions, which will percolate from your mind and from your body and from your senses. Then you will operate. So you have to allow that to happen. Allowing that is an is an art, you know, and that is what the master told us that Simran can help us greatly on this. It keeps on giving us those areas that how we can really do that part and how nicely we can implement all that. So this is what we got to understand. And the balancing act has to be very carefully done because if you find that this ability of your, of your soul, which is running these two systems, body and mind 24-7, it energizes them. So it is running it all the time. It is already with you. Now this energy, if it is realized by the satsang and by the initiation of the perfect living master, which really gives you his grace to remember all this. If we can remember his face that he initiated us to manage these things. Say, for example, if you are having certain problems in your daily life, certain commitments. If you start using your mind to solve it, it won't solve my dear. It will trap you into that karma. And if you rely <laughs> on the absolute, on the master, then he provides you, he prompts you. How it prompts you, it gives you some intuitions. And if we are, you know, clogged by the mind, past and future information, we will miss that intuition, which is coming, he's there with us, telling us to do something, but we are under the spell of the mind. And the ego of the mind and the mind says, I know everything, I can manage. So <laughs> the mind is playing with you and dragging you into that particular problem. Because here, if you look at your those initial needs I talked about, you know, hunger, clothes, housing, now you got to see that you give your attention only to the legitimate needs of the mind and legitimate needs of the body, which are enough to manage this, to keep it healthy and happy. And it is in your hands because if you give your attention to the mind, it will remind you of the past and future and make you sad. It means you are spoiling your happiness. You have given your energy to the mind. And then it is, it is rather working the work of the Kaal, you know, the custodian. And he is, one way or the other, he tricks you in. Now, if you know this, that how the mind is going to trick you. Because at that particular moment, some kind of a memory will come to you. As I say that high tide, low tide operates those portions of your brain. And only those kind of memories will come in front of you. And you will unknowingly act on that. So we discussed about how to develop this restraining intelligence. And I did talk a few times on it. That even while speaking, you got to hold that sentence. And whenever you are doing an act, hold that act for a moment. Review it. Whether it is based on the needs of the body. Are they legitimate or illegitimate needs? And something from the mind. Is it related to the mind, past and future? It means it is the mind. And then it is trying to agitate you. And you know, the attributes of the mind are not sustainable, which is lust, anger, ego, attachment, deceit, fears, and worries. And it is connected with laws of nature and all information. So this simple formula of knowing that you are the divine and 
uh, we have designed this system known as co-aim theory in practice. It is correlation of your attention with information, which is your mind and material, which is your body. So now that attention can always look into that and can pick up those legitimate needs and act on them. So this has to come uh, as a practice with you. And this is what is the most balancing act to do your commitments of this world and at the same time, you know, do your meditation. Because Ishwarji said that even for 10 minutes, if you can fully withdraw your attention, it, it gives you all that. All of a sudden, a gush of knowledge starts flowing in. So this is how it happens in real life. That whenever there is a situation like this, I'll hold everything, close my eyes for a moment, and something will start. Just do that. Please practice this area. And then you will find that how he is solving all your problems because you are representing him. He is doing it all. He has done it. So then you don't remain as you. You don't use that word I. I have done this. No, he is doing it. So if he is doing it, we are just without any, any responsibilities. He will manage those areas of our commitments. Because he can scan my mind, all that past and future information and what all I'm doing. What are those strings attached to me of my family and of my material, means time and material, past and future. The material body connected with certain um, material aspects, which is my money, my business, my colleagues, and then all that. And the other day I was telling you that how the mind is connected everywhere and it operates. So uh, the duality comes in here that if we understand there are two energies and this positive and negative. So if we, if we want to rely on that part, we can always say and we can always switch off the energy to the body needs and to the needs of the mind if we find that they are not legitimate because to keep your body healthy and to remain happy because happiness will always encourage you to meditate and that bliss which is there gives you a lot of rest immediately you are a fresh person and i could see that many a times if you close your eyes for a moment all of a sudden you get the feel of that energy, which again helps you to do or to manage your things. So this is how I have explained the today's part of balancing your spiritual life and the commitments here. So now, Michael, uh, is it enough time or uh, you want me to talk for a few more minutes? That's good. That, that, that was so beautiful, Dr. Chong. Very, Thank very, you. very valuable. But I Thank love you. it. But if we have a problem, just close our eyes and let Master bring the true knowledge, the 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 yeah. solution, the solution. The intuitions, yes. The solutions yes. will come yes. through intuitions. Yes. And all of a sudden, you will have that gut feeling that I can do this like this. Yeah. And then you know this this you can use everywhere in uh, in all the walks of life. You know, sometimes you feel that you are much more. You know, you are having that anger for certain things. So you just hold it. It's part of the mind which is playing with you. Sometimes the lust comes and you can hold it. Okay. And then you, you can look into your attachments, egos. Everything is visible. Now, luckily, the master has given you that eye, which is not these two eyes, you know. The ability to see is behind the eyes, which can see without the eyes. So if you have got that ability, now let us use that. And it's so easy to use. And I'm so happy to always talk to you, all of you, and every day this is what is happening. 
and it is so heartening to to be here with you most of the time i put off my uh, audio and video and listen that what all you are talking and what what uh, you know the shabad which everybody is reciting is so intoxicating as he says the cup of nectar is available so here you know all of us we are about 42 here so let's do cheers then <laughs> you know the the cup which michael was holding i drank already, I drank so, already. <laughs> yes, but cheers very drunk you know <laughs> and every day dr chand every day i feel it that every day master serves us with a cup of nectar that is not yeah, served anywhere else he yeah, gives it is not served anywhere else. Yes, and uh, so that's why nobody, like lovers of God, should not miss. And it's not whoever talks; it's not. It is. It is the presence of the Master that we are all after. Yeah, yeah. Not not if me talking or you talking or him talking. Yeah, it's a must, it's, master talking out of you. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's it right. is Master. It is master, it's the master which is talking. And that's where that's where uh, we get our bliss and our nectar and our intoxication. It is only from the Master. So I hope everybody will always come and fill his cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. You know, that's great. I think uh, it is already ten thirty. Okay. Going to be another one or two minutes. Yeah, I, so, I can, I can now. Uh, we can now meditate for five minutes, and I'll play. Uh, I'll play the video of Master. Very well, very well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very cool. Much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Chong. That was so so a treasure, a treasure house of words that you gave us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
one. There never has been anything outside of it. The many have been created within the one. What would happen if any one of us sitting here got an awareness of who we are? If we suddenly discovered that we are not this physical body, it's just a cover upon ourselves. That we are not the sensory perceptions, they are just instruments we are using to perceive a drama created outside of ourselves. If we suddenly discover that the thoughts we were having are merely churning out of a certain stream of words, stream of images by a machine we have installed in ourselves. That we are beyond all these three. That we are totality of consciousness. What would be our experience? We suddenly experience that everything that we have ever experienced or will experience is taking place within one totality and that's our true self. That our true self has never been more than one. Everything that has happened which creates the experience of the many is taking place within the one. Nothing has ever happened outside of it. Nothing can happen outside of it. That's a great revelation. Perfect living masters come into this world not to teach us new morality. They do not come to teach us the way to live. They do not come to teach us how to reform your political systems. They do not come to teach you how to reform your social systems. They come to show you that you can, while you're trapped in these bodies, while you're trapped in your sensory systems, while you're trapped in your mind, you can still have the experience of who you are. And that experience is generated by first that totality appearing within the show as a perfect living master, as a human being outside of yourself, and then going within yourself stage by stage. Darja ba darja, as great master would say, step by step, you discover your own reality. And the ultimate reality you find at all times, there was only one consciousness. The show of the many took place in one alone. And we are participating in the one that we've never been separated. Our reality is that one. All rest is created. All rest is illusion. This is a great opportunity that is provided to every seeker. Whoever seeks to find the truth can find it. How do you find it? By going within. How do you go within? By discovering a person outside in your life who has gone within. And a person that you discover outside your life who has gone within will take you only as far as he has gone can't take you more. And the difficulty is that in this subject of spiritual awareness, every level that we perceive looks like the final level. People get a little glimpse of something and they say this is reality. People have different kind of journeys and they have inner experiences. Some people have experiences by knocking at the doors of different chakras below. People take drugs and say they get extra uh, uh, sensory perceptions, they get extra experiences. Whatever they do, every experience looks to them as if it is the final experience beyond the physical. Therefore, there are limitations. Every teacher, every master of every kind has a limit to what he can teach you, where he can take you. Most of these I have discovered. I just celebrated my 84th birthday and you are coming and saying happy birthday to me. 84 years is a lot of time, you know, in a physical world in one body to research this thing. And my research has shown that 99.9% .9 of the teachers who are today teaching us what is spiritual are teaching us what lies within the mind and the created universe outside. They've given us different levels. They've given us inner experiences. They give us journeys into the unknown. But it's all up to the level of time, space and the mind. The number of perfect living masters who can tell us that the reality of your own self is not divided at all, it lies beyond the mind, is so few. At all times you can count it on the number of fingers on your hands. It's so little. So therefore, it's not possible by doing a research and going into a list of spiritual teachers, you can go on uh, internet and say thousands of teachers are there teaching the same thing. In every country, in fact, in India, if you go, there are more teachers than students today. And great master used to say, the guruship has grown so much that there are more gurus than chelas. So that is why uh, people are teaching everything. But the teaching 
is not what the perfect living masters take us to. They do not come here to teach. They come here to take us back home. It's a big distinction between the two. Teaching they follow because others are doing the teaching. They follow a, a format for their work of taking us back home by following what the format is going on in the universe around. And our mind will not accept other formats. Therefore, they give a long rope to us. They say, go ahead, follow this, follow that also. Is this better for you? Go ahead with that. You are following something else. Go ahead with that also. They do not discourage us. Anything they feel is taking us towards the realization of who we are inside, they encourage. They do not even say, oh, don't first find out a perfect guru and then follow him. They say, follow any guru who tells you, follow any teacher who tells you to go within themselves. Because they know that every one of these people who come into our life and guide us towards our own inner self is taking a step towards their path. But to take us beyond our own mind to our own reality is left to the privilege of the perfect living masters who themselves operate from beyond the mind and can take us beyond the mind to our own reality. That is why the qualification required to find a perfect living master is a very simple one. It's an earnest desire to seek. If you are a seeker in your heart, in your mind, and you are seeking the truth because you are fed up with the untruth, if you are seeking the reality because the show you have been through is too messy, is too bad, you are done with it, you are fed up with it, if you are in that state and you are seeking, you're bound to find a perfect living master eventually. That's the system. There is no other way to find a perfect living master except through seeking. If you think that you can judge by the qualifications of a human being and find out who is a perfect living master, I tell you, you are a master yourself then. Then you are as good as that perfect living master. If you have such, such a knowledge that you can say this person is a perfect living master. Because a perfect living master will never say I'm a master. He will not even exhibit the qualities of some of these qualified psychics and qualified people who are showing extrasensory perception and for doing street miracles. He won't even do that. He doesn't have to. That's not his job. His job is to pick up the seeker and divulge to the seeker who is and take him back home. So therefore, it is not that we find a master. There is no way we can find a master. I know no way in which a human being with a sharp intellect can ever find a master. He'll keep on analyzing and say, this one has these characteristics, this one doesn't. He's too ordinary to be a master. This one, no, I, I asked him something, he didn't have the answer, not a master. You check list of what our intellect tells us could be a master, is so faulty that we cannot see where the love lies, where love and devotion can take us. The mind is incapable of love and devotion. Only the spirit can love. Therefore, when you use the mind exclusively to search for a master, you fail. But a master can find you. The truth is that every person I have met in my life who has been able to get initiated by a perfect living master has been found by the master. By series of coincidences in life, series of steps that have gone into the life, different levels through which they passed, different kind of seekings they had, different kind of disappointments they had, different kind of pain and suffering they had in the physical world, all added up to their being ready. And when they were ready, by coincidence, a person comes along, and happens to be the perfect living master, and they enable that seeker very quickly, in spite of the objections of the mind, to find out this was a master. So this is something, it is not based upon intellectual or rational principles. It's based upon the intensity of inner seeking. If you seek intensely, a master will come and pick you up. Of course, the mind will question, mind will doubt. Because apart from the function of thinking that the mind has been given, it has also been given the function of uh, putting things together, creating logical sequences. And therefore, the mind has to question everything. By questioning everything, 
it is a great generator of doubts. And therefore it doubts everything. If you give a clear indication to the mind, this is it, there must be catch in it. Let me find out what the catch is. The skepticism is built into the mind and therefore the mind will create doubts. And what follows from the doubts is fear. Once you have a doubt, you also have fear. So doubt and fear seems to be a subsidiary function of the mind. Not very good for a spiritual seeker, but that's what comes in the way. Even when a seeker with intense seeking from his soul and his spirit comes across a person, a human being who happens to be a perfect living master, the mind will create these doubts and create these fears. And to overcome them, it takes time, but the method perfect living masters use is first go along with you to satisfy your mind, put it aside. Okay, what are your questions? Here are the answers. Okay, you got some answers? Okay, any more questions? Yeah, I have more. Okay, gradually say, what questions am I asking? What is the relevance of these questions? My seeking is deeper than these questions. What am I trying to satisfy myself for? Then comes the path that you get trapped. Then you have no questions. Then you only feel, this guy has some kind of a love which I haven't experienced before. The difference in the love that a master can give us is that it is unconditional. It is not based upon our reciprocity. It is not based upon what we do. A master, if he's a perfect living master, will allow us to experience love which is unconditional. You don't experience because you love the master. You may hate the master. If you're on his list, you will experience unconditional love from that master. You can do whatever you like. You still experience unconditional love from a master. That distinguishes that human being from all other human beings. And therefore, gradually, you come to realize this is a different connection we have. This is something different happening to us. And that's when the revelation comes. And then following the instructions, a master gives merely to satisfy our mind and to satisfy the sensory and bodily functions of us. He says, do meditation, follow these disciplines, follow this. Mind says, that looks very sensible. You must get something by doing these things. And if we follow that, eventually we discover that none of them was necessary except the love and devotion and connection with the master through that affection that he was giving us. The mind would not accept it. So the master takes us through a series of steps which ultimately lead to a faith built upon the love we are experiencing. The faith is not built upon the other experiences we are having. Then we are having experiences here which are self-created to keep up the show in working order. The show of creation in the physical world has to be kept in working order and one law alone has been able to achieve that. Orderliness of this show has been achieved by one law and that's called the law of karma. It's a wonderful law. Uh, if I had to design a law for any kind of created universe, I couldn't find a better one than that. The law of karma states very simply, whatever you do willfully with your intention, you must reap the consequences. Do good, you get a reward. Do bad, you are punished. Do good and bad, you are rewarded and punished. It's not that one cancels the other. You never cancel anything. This law is so beautiful. This law completely perpetuates the creation. It makes the creation permanent. Because you can do whatever you like. And you come up for the consequence of it. So you stay here. No way to escape. There could be never a bigger prison house a better designed trap than the law of karma. And one law has been used to perpetuate and create this universe in this form that whatever you do, you're trapped here. You can't get out. You can, you can achieve very high status by continuously doing good things. You can reach status of the creator of the universe at a certain level. They said that uh, Krishna, one of the avatars, avatars of uh, Vishnu, the god of sustenance in Hindu, um, Hindu religion, 
yeah, in the Hindu pantheons of gods, Vishnu is considered to be the sustainer of the universe. And he comes in the form of avatars who come as incarnations of that god to take care of the world. That is what the Indian books say. According to that, one of the avatars, well-known avatars, was Krishna. We call him Lord Krishna. Worship him. We worship Krishna. Many people in Hawaii, in Honolulu, are saying, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. At airports, they used to say that. You might have heard that. That Krishna, when he was very young, he had awareness that he had come to sustain and to see the sustenance of the world, that the world was running according to the law of karma. And therefore, even at a very young age, he's speaking to a friend of his called Udo. And that's a very famous saying of his. He tells the young boy, Udo, Krishna himself is a young man. He says, Udo, karman ki gat nyari se, that the nature of karma is very, very rare and very difficult to find out. And then he points out to an ant crawling on the ground. He says, Udo, see this ant crawling on this ground? It's taken the form of an ant. It has once been Brahma, the creator of this universe. At one time, it was also head of one of the heavens called Indra, and he has been heading that heaven. Law of karma got him those positions, and the law of karma brought him back as an insect now. The law of karma is such relentless that you can reach the highest level, be a run, running the as a creator of the universe, then become an insect. He pointed out that the law of karma is such a relentless law. It has made this universe perpetual. It has made this creation perpetual. This creation is as permanent as the creator now. And when you dissolve this creation, you set the seeds for a new creation on the same law. So this law of karma binds us here. It's a mental law. It's a law that the mind recognizes. All judicial laws of different countries have been framed on that basis. They're framed on the same basis. You do good, you are rewarded. You do bad, you are punished. And the punishment will be according to how bad you are. And what makes good and bad? Your mind makes it what is good or bad. Like Shakespeare says, there's nothing either good or bad. Your mind makes it good or bad. Our own conscience, which is an aspect of the mind, the mind's aspect called conscience, says this is good, this is bad. We trap ourselves with that. There is no way to get out of all this. And nobody can tell us how to get out of this, except one who is operating outside this whole system. <coughs> and what is outside the system? Our soul, our consciousness, even now, while we are sitting here, talking to each other, is lying in the realm beyond the system, beyond the mind. But we are trapped because we identify ourselves with the mind, we identify ourselves with the senses, we identify ourselves with the body, and we are trapped here. The perfect living masters, even when they are in human form, in our life, while they are talking to us as human beings, they are in touch with their consciousness beyond the mind. They are in touch with the reality while they are talking to us as human beings. Therefore, there's a very big difference in an association with such people. When you associate with them, the very presence of somebody who at the very time that we are with them, is talking with knowledge of total consciousness in which you and that person both are included. When you see a perfect living master in a human body, you are not seeing a person, you are seeing your own self and that person together. But you can't see that, because you're seeing only the outside. But the perfect living master is seeing both. He's seeing you in your totality, himself in his totality, and there is no difference in the two. Look at the viewpoint. Look at what the viewpoint of a master of that kind would be. When we come across such a person, he's looking at us and looking at the world, imagine what he's seeing. He's seeing oneness, he's seeing himself. He's seeing how the show has been set up. He sees how different individuated souls created to experience different points of view of the same consciousness are operating and how some are ready to go back to the totality, some are still working here. He sees that. Therefore, when we come across a person like that, and he says, I accept you. Your name is on my list. As a human being, I've come here. I had a limited list. 
Because I didn't come for trillions and trillions of souls who are scattered in the universe. I came for a limited number who were ready. I came with that. Other human beings will come. They have always come. Human beings will always come endowed with this capacity of retaining their total consciousness and they will be called perfect living masters and they'll pick up the souls that are on their list. They're marked souls. They are like a shepherd come to collect his marked sheep. It's like that. So therefore, when a person who is a perfect living master comes and accepts him, we call that acceptance initiation. We say to get initiation, initiated by a perfect living master is the greatest thing that can happen. I believe that. I believe there is no event in human life or any life that can compare with this. I don't know any event whatsoever that compare with a perfect living master with that consciousness coming into our life and saying, I accept you for initiation. Changes everything. It has changed everything from that moment. Your life has undergone the biggest possible change. You are no longer bound by the laws of karma. You are no longer bound by anything that attaches you here. Everything is now being governed by totality of consciousness operating through a master who then manifests in your local consciousness, even in your physical consciousness. He manifests. And on a daily basis, we begin to see events happening in the outside show. This must be the hand of the master. This is a miracle happening for me. That's a great coincidence that happened. Even little, little things like that keep on happening and we attribute it to the master because he is now involved. He has got totally involved. He has taken you out of the normal laws of karma. You have a huge accumulation of karma. I sometimes mention to you how big the reserve we have built of karma over centuries and centuries of reincarnation and that can create millions of future lives. When a perfect living master initiates you, he burns and destroys all that reserve karma. There is no reserve karma to create any future lives. So therefore the very law which sustains and perpetuates this universe is being broken at that time. And you have only a few karma of this life left. And the few decisions you are making with your mind, with your so-called free will in this life, that's the only karma left. It's a very big change. And then after that, you say, I am going to do my duty, I am going to do these things. The master says, why worry? I have accepted you. I'll do all that for you. Do you know that if you are initiated by a perfect living master, and you say, master, now I initiated to everything for me. I want to do nothing, he'll, he'll do it for you. Everything that you can think of, conceive of, he can do. The mind doesn't accept it. The mind and our external circumstances don't accept it. We keep on saying, Master, I want to do it, give me help. I can do a little bit, you'd give me some support in this. Master says, go ahead. Okay, whatever you think you can do, go ahead. It's so difficult for us to surrender in the early stages of our experiences on the spiritual path, to surrender to a power that has taken over control, that has taken over responsibility, that has taken over everything. And therefore, as time grows and you discover that what you're trying to do, what your struggle is, what your duties are, and you are performing them, behind that, the master is putting his hand, okay, okay, give you a little push here, give you a little push here. You have to go through the some karma, old karma, but only for this life. All right, I'll help you. If it is too hard, let me know. I'll try to wangle some little elements of it and change it. It's a great relationship. Do you know I have not found any greater relationship of two friends except one, a disciple and his master. They're the best of friends. There is no real friendship like that. A friendship where you feel that you stand for each other. A friendship where you feel you are at the same level and equal. It's the most beautiful relationship. One of my colleagues uh, who was a disciple of great master, beautiful man, he was a veterinary doctor. I tell you his stories many times. In smaller groups one day I will tell you more stories. His name was Dr. Isha Singh. He came to the conclusion, after wonderful experiences with his master, he came to the conclusion that a perfect living master 
becomes a friend first, master next, not the other way around. Don't think that he's a master first and then he becomes friendly. Not at all. He says he's a friend first, then he reveals he's a master. So therefore, this friendship, that the feeling that you <clears throat> can do things common, you can share in each other's work, he reduces his work. A perfect living master comes and starts working in this world. He can run. One master was weaving all his life. Amongst his disciples were rich multimillionaires who said, give up the weaving loom. You don't need it. He said, I need it. I need it to work with people who are working in the same way. Another one was a cobbler, mending shoes. He remained a cobbler and kings were sitting at his feet and following him. He said, you don't need, you can come to our palace and live there. No, it's necessary for me to be a cobbler because I have to be friends with people who only can accept me as a cobbler, not in the royal palace. The masters come and engage themselves in activities in the physical world which match the activities of their disciples and therefore they become friends. So this friendship is so important. That itself changes one's life. I have said so many things about creation. I have said things about things big beyond the mind. The rational mind can say, you're making up these stories. I can. Anybody can make stories. Maybe nothing exists. Maybe there's no such thing uh, as uh, any higher reason. Maybe this is the whole thing, materialists believe. The materialism believes this is the whole thing, right here. Everything else is just imaginary, made up by us. Okay, maybe it is. If I were to go along and say, yes, this is all material thing, even then, I say the story I made up is very good, made me so happy, took care of everything. All my life changed just by a story. It's a very good story then. But I, in the story, in the process of making a story, I found a friend who was a perfect friend. A friend from whom I experienced unconditional love. I never experienced that without the story. So the story is very fundamental. It doesn't matter what your faith about the story is or not. It's the experience that you have with a man like that, that convinces you this is something different going on. It's not the level of knowledge, intellectual knowledge that will tell you who a perfect living master is. It's the experience with that master that will tell you who he or she is. Therefore, this path is a path of love and devotion and friendship. It gives you an experience of true friendship, gives you experience of true love, it gives you experience of unconditional love, which is otherwise extremely rare. I can't find it. I go, people say we are, what do they call it? We are uh, souls, what are they called? Pair. My dear Holy Family, that was great from Master. I wish I can have, I wish I can stop time and have a timeless moment with Ishwar Puriji. That would be so great. So maybe we can do it in meditation. If we can forget about the body below and the world outside and come up here to the third eye center where Master is waiting in the timeless moment and uh, repeat Simran of the Holy Name slowly with the tongue of, uh, with the tongue of thought with intervals, hold his hand, and I wish you the best meditation. I hope to see you tomorrow for another holy day and Holy Father God. Thank you for coming. I will, uh, I will keep Zoom on for 20 minutes.